Okay, I think we've expecting a, a few more people who will probably come in in the next couple of minutes. Let me turn off my soundtrack. Uh, first, I'd like to just say welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Susan O'Handley and I am a co-president for Delaware Otsego Audubon Society. Uh, we were asked one time what uh, DOAS meant because I often will just refer shorthand to DOAS. Um, stands for Delaware Otsego Audubon Society. And if you've seen our slideshow, you know our mission is to protect our natural environment and connect people to nature um, to benefit birds and other wildlife through conservation, education, research, and advocacy. A uh, couple of announcements for this evening. Uh, our optics raffle is now taking place. We have 250 tickets total available at $10 per ticket. Uh, we have about 122 remaining. First prize on that is the Nikon Monarch 7 binoculars with a shoulder harness. Second prize, Nikon Monarch 5 binoculars with shoulder harness. And third prize is a $50 gift card to Wild Birds Unlimited in Johnson City. The drawing for that will take place at our April 16th program. And you can find full details at our website at www.doas.us. So thank you again for joining us this evening for highlights from Down Under with Dr. Pam Lee. If you have questions during our presentation, please use the Q&A function um, that you find in the control panel in Zoom. Um, desktop, it's usually at the bottom of your screen. Um, in other devices, it might be towards the top where you might have to tap the screen to open up that panel. Uh, we'll also be monitoring the chat section for any comments that might come in. Uh, but the Q&A section helps us keep track of what's been asked and what's been answered. Um, and our moderators for this evening, Becky Gretton and Charlie Scheim, will be relaying those questions at appropriate times during the program. So I think we'll have one break in, in the early part and then we'll take any questions and answers through that time. And then we'll wait till the end of the program for the rest of the questions and answers at that point. A um, Couple of additional announcements. Next month's bird uh, program will take place on April 16th. So a month from now at 7.30 PM. It's Birds and Beans, Simple Ways to Save Migratory Birds. And that will be presented by naturalist, author, and Pulitzer Prize finalist, Scott Wiedensall. Pre-registration is required and full details are at the website. Earth Festival is coming up. Um, the dates for that are April 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Uh, part of that event will be virtual. And then they're doing a drive-through drop-off recycling opportunity on Saturday, April 24th. So as you know, in the past, they've done styrofoam collection and paper shredding for confidential documents and things like that. So um, this year, you just have to sign up for a time slot. I think their hours are between 10 and 11, 11 a.m. 11 and 2 p.m. Um, so you sign up for a time slot and then you go down, um, I believe it's at the Meadows Complex where they'll be taking care of all that recycling material. Uh, additional details on the virtual events are still pending, but we'll update our activities through e-news and our website, and then full information about everything going on for Earth Festival will be available at the Otsego County Conservation Association website, which is occainfo.org. Our Members and Friends Photo Share program has been shifted to May 21st, 7.30 p.m. Photos are still being accepted. Information also is on the website and pre-registration is also required for that program. Um, all of the information you'll find online. Uh, coming up in May, we're also working with a local enthusiast group for an electric vehicle car show and details will be announced sometime in April um, for that. Uh, Birds and Beans Coffee and our DOAS reusable bags continue to be available for sale with Oneonta Porch Pickup through Jane Backman. Jane's contact email is available on our website in the shop section. 
And we also have one Kestrel box that's currently available for sale for $30 and that can be uh, purchased through Jane as well. Uh, our climate action initiatives continue. And if you read the recent issue of the DOAS newsletter, The Belted Kingfisher, we are asking people in our chapter region to please use our new carbon tracker app, which is now available at the website. Um, we're looking to get some baseline data as a starting point for our region's household carbon emissions. And then we're trying to track our progress as we move forward. So please reach out to me if you have any questions or if you need any help or guidance in setting that up. Um, you can email me at info at doas.us. And now we go over to Becky to introduce our speaker. <laughs> Becky? Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Our speaker this evening is local retired veterinarian, Dr. Pam Lee. Pam was owner and sole operator of the Exeter Veterinary Clinic for the majority of her 40 years in practice. Pam's wanderlust, inherited from her father, has taken her to six continents, honing her amateur photography skills along the way. In the fall of 2019, she went to Tasmania, Australia, and New, England, and New Zealand. <laughs> we will experience some of the highlights from Down Under with Pam tonight. Welcome, Pam. Thank you, Becky. Let's see. Share the screen. Uh, share the screen. Uh, full screen. Okay, can everybody hear me? Can they hear me? Yes, yes, Pam. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> that was one of my, uh, well, welcome everyone. I'm glad uh, you could join me this evening. I really should say uh, good day, mates. Um, but uh, I have to give one caveat here. I am not a, a techno savvy, so this is not a PowerPoint. Um, it's a very simple old school slideshow and uh, I still hope you will enjoy what I have to, to share with you tonight. I'm going to start out here with a map. Uh, first, uh, I have to tell you that it's a long and arduous journey to get uh, down under. Um, my old college roommate Ivy went with me and we started out from Binghamton to Philadelphia to Los Angeles and a 16 hour flight to uh, Melbourne here and another hour and a half to Hobart before we finally got there, losing a day uh, with the international dateline. How, uh, how that happens, I'm not sure, but we lost a day and they assured us we would gain it back, which I guess we did at the other end of the trip. But I wanted to put a, um, a map here, which uh, is about as much uh, capable as I am of uh, taking a screen screenshot and putting it uh, in this presentation. But um, anyway, this is a map of Australia, as you can see. Um, and I'm just going to outline our uh, trip. It was we had five days in Tasmania, two weeks in Australia, and two weeks in New Zealand with uh, overseas adventure travel which I've traveled with them before. They're a very small group um, and uh, they take good care of us. I recommend it highly. Um, after flying into Melbourne and going to Hobart, I'll just uh, give you a brief uh, overview here. We went down to Port Arthur and there's a little island off of Tasmania, Tasman Island, um, where Port Arthur is. We went to the temperate rainforest here in the middle of Tasmania then up to uh, Launceston, uh, where the airport was to fly back to Melbourne, where we got a few days there. Uh, then a quick flight to Adelaide and up to Alice Springs in the red center of Australia here. Uh, of course, most of the population is all around the outside. The outback uh, has few people. Uh, but this is where Ayers Rock is. And then we flew to Cairns up in the northeastern part um, to Port Douglas the Great Barrier Reef and the Daintree Rainforest, and then back down to Sydney, where we had a few days um, touring before we went to New Zealand. Uh, let me see here. 
This is the initial crew in Hobart. Uh, there were nine of us and four more joined us uh, for the rest of Australia and New Zealand. Um, nice small group. We got to know them very well. Whoops. Uh, Hobart and uh, many of the cities in Australia that we did visit uh, have sa these sandstone uh, buildings. This is a church. And uh, we got there on a Saturday, which allowed for us to visit the famous Salamanca uh, Farmer's Market. So we took that in before we uh, had dinner. Then we were off to the um, Royal Tasmanian Botanical Garden. We were there uh, the end of November and beginning of December, which was uh, the end of their spring, beginning of summer. So you'll see many pictures in my presentation here of uh, things from the really out of this world. Uh, roses were everywhere we went. Just a few from the Tasmanian uh, Botanical Garden. Spectacular roses everywhere. This is a picture of uh, Port Arthur on Tasman Island, where the uh, Great Britain sent their convicts in the 1800s. Um, they uh, figured they'd either die trying to swim across the 150 miles to uh, Tasmania or die in the forest trying. And these are the remnants of the uh, prison. They cataloged every prisoner in the museum there so we could, uh, you could read about them. Um, they all were sent over mostly in the six in the 1800s rather uh, this is a typical one he uh, was arrested in uh, for pick, picking pockets and was transportation for life to Port Arthur to mend his drunken ways they did try to uh, rehabilitate many of the prisoners and so when he was done being a cook and barber for everybody uh, as you can see he was a leech gatherer at the hospital in Hobart afterwards in one of the gardens in the back of the cottage is there, this beautiful little superb uh, fairy wren in his ble uh, breeding plumage. Superb fairy wren. If you do ever get to Tasmania, this is uh, the one tourist attraction you I recommend highly, uh, Pentecost Wilderness Journeys. It's a three hour boat ride around the coast of Tasman Island. It's just spectacular um, landscape, wild ocean, uh, tallest sea cliffs in Australia. Many of them had uh, caves within them. We got to back into one there. The purple algae is ac the actual color there is the true color. We saw sea lions, bottlenose dolphins, humpback whales, cormorants. And then off to a wildlife sanctuary, this Bonarong, well-renowned uh, in Tasmania. One of the reasons I wanted to go as a bucket list trip in my retirement uh, here was to see these special animals that uh, are nowhere else in the world. Um, Tasmanian devil here being one of them. This is a Bennett's redneck wallaby and her joey. There's uh, kangaroos and there's wallabies and then in between size wise are the wallaroos. Uh, these wallabies were much smaller of course than the big kangaroos. This is a female Eastern gray kangaroo, the most common uh, species there, giving the flame and lip curl, taking in our pheromones, I guess, like a horse would. You can see their middle toe uh, is quite a dagger. This is a wombat. They're like our uh, woodchucks, only they weigh about 30 pounds. Um, they're burrowers. 
you can see from their toes. Um, one interesting fact about the wombats, uh, compared to other marsupials, is they have a backward pouch so that when they're digging in the dirt, uh, it doesn't get into their pouch and bother the babies. Many of you have probably seen emus before. They're the second largest ratite or flightless bird next to the ostrich. Um, I did taste emu jerky while I was over there, pretty tasty. They raise them for food as we do here. These guys are Tasmanian devils and uh, they weigh about 15 pounds. They purse for their size, they have the biggest uh, jaw force at 200 pounds per square inch. They're scavengers. They are the only uh, carnivorous marsupial. Um, and they're quite interesting creatures. I, I do have a little snippet of a, a movie here, if it plays all right. Listen for their, uh, there's one scream at the beginning, how they get their name. Uh, they sound devilish when in the dark at night when they're out. The Tasmanian devils will have, come on, you can do this. How do I go back to the movie? It's not doing it. Hold on a minute. How do I do this, guy? Um, just a minute. We're stuck. Go back to your pictures. Here we go. All right. I hope everything's going okay. Can they hear me? <laughs> Are you able to hear me? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can okay, hear you. Okay, good. Just, uh, just checking. Um, another uh, little bit of information on those Tas Tasmanian devils. They'll have 20 to 30 babies, but they only have four teats. Uh, so they kind of uh, selects for the strongest uh, survival of the fittest, for sure. Um, after we visited that sanctuary, we uh, were heading to the temperate rainforest at Cradle Mountain, and uh, we stopped at this wool shop along the way here. Whoops. Of course, Tasmania is known for its, uh, and New Zealand, Australia, for their sheep. Um, the wool, this was a cataloging uh, store that sorted the wool and sold it. This is a black swan. I didn't see any white swans. They had uh, beautiful black swans there. We got to Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Site, um, which is a temperate rainforest, uh, different than the tropical ones if you've, we've been to. Um, you could feel the moisture in the air on our trek. Uh, the Cradle Mountain uh, circuit is the one we went on. All moss and strange pine trees and lichen. Just uh, the water was dripping off of everything, including us. This is a field with some uh, lichen, coral lichen they call it. Looks like our coral from the ocean. The topography was something like I'd never seen before uh, with tussock grasses and uh, just this is the outflow from Lake Lila. Dove Lake. We had a night uh, tour with the spotlight. It wasn't quite dark yet here, but this is a, again a, a wild Bennett's wallaby and her baby. 
and a wild wombat. Something to see the animals in the wild compared to uh, in the wildlife sanctuaries. Nice to see them doing their own thing. An interesting fact about wombats is they make cubic feces. Um, apparently so the wind doesn't blow them around and they can stay in one place and mark their territory. Exactly how they produce those, if we're not sure, but uh, they do. On to the platypus house, which these two animals are two that I really wanted to see for sure. Um, they're monotremes, meaning they're egg-laying mammals. They're uh, the third, compared uh, next to placentals and marsupials, then there's monotremes. This platypus, as many of you know, have like a beaver tail, a duck bill, web feet. The males have a toxic spur on their back foot. Uh, they are egg, the two egg-laying uh, mammals. They don't have teats, however. They have modified sweat glands in between folds in their skin that the babies uh, suckle the milk still, but they can't attach to teats. They also don't have teeth. They grind their food, and they have electroreceptors on their bills. So um, when they swim around at the bottom, they close their eyes and just sweep their bills back and forth, sensing uh, their food, and then they grind it up. There's another short video here of them in action. They have to keep swimming or they float to the surface. I don't hear sound at all. Mm -hmm. Damn it, where's the sound? Mm -hmm. I can't get it while I want. Anyway, very interesting creatures. How do I do that again? I gotta go up here. The, uh, this is an echidna. They look like a cross between an anteater and a hedgehog. Uh, they also have quite the claws on them. Oh, I can't hear anything. I don't know where the sound is, but that's all right. <laughs> they, uh, great termite eaters especially. They only lay one egg and the baby hatches and uh, stays within a skin fold of their body all, their, all the time until they're weaned. We're now off, uh, flew off to, back to uh, Melbourne. This is a picture of the old treasury building, uh, again, Victorian sandstone buildings. Oops. The Hotel Windsor, the Princess Theater. I'm not a city person, but our guide, Jeremy, was a, a native Melbournean, and he gave us a royal tour of the city. This is an alley with a very famous alley, Graffiti Alley. Uh, city things, <laughs> the desserts in the window. Uh, famous uh, Australian New Zealand dessert is pavlova, which is a meringue with uh, kiwi fruit, strawberries, and cream, which we got to taste, of course. It was Christmas time, or getting to be, so there's chocolates. Famous clock that they gonged on the hour. Queen Victoria's Market. You could buy anything there, food or merchandise. This is an illegal picture. I wasn't supposed to take it till after I took it, I re realized. Uh, but it's artistic, very beautiful uh, didgeridoos. We tried uh, playing some PVC didgeridoos, but we weren't too successful. It was funny trying, though. Again, another botanical garden. 
This one is in um, Melbourne, Victoria. Fern Franz mean new growth is coming. It's hope for hope for the future. And of course it's the uh, symbol in New Zealand, uh, the silver fern is uh, their emblem in their sports teams. We had a gu uh, guide, Aboriginal guide of the botanical gardens who described many of the plants uh, and their uses um, for the uh, Aborigines. This is the whole crew of us. In the evening, we took the tram to St. Kilda's Pier where uh, these little blue fairy penguins come ashore to their barrels after fishing all day. Uh, limited viewing, so uh, I was lucky to catch a, a picture of them. Sweet little guys, they're only about a foot tall, they're the smallest penguin species. We had a opportunity which uh, a few of us took to take the Great Ocean Drive along the eastern coast, um, north from Melbourne. This is the uh, Port Campbell National Park. It was just gorgeous there. A couple of views, very, very windy. This area subsequently was burned in the brush fires, sadly, but I'm sure we'll rebound. Just wild seas. Double rainbow. All right, we must have flown from Melbourne to Adelaide and now we're on our way to Alice Springs. Uh, very few roads, uh, you can see where those 18-wheeler trains uh, would take supplies to the center, red center of Australia on a road straight like that. Really very barren. Evaporated uh, salt lakes. You can see Ayers Rock uh, sticks right out of the middle of the desert. Also known as Uluru by the First Peoples. Very sacred area and actually uh, the caretakers are the Aborigines of this uh, rock. It's, it's their tourist attraction, so to speak. There's a sign you see, uh, it's like our white-tailed deer signs crossing. We had a trek uh, in 100 degree weather through Simpson Gap, which is part of the McDonald Range. Red rocks. Uh, these are giant boulders actually, but right in the middle you can see these little black flanked, black footed wallabies who hide in their burrows during the day when it's really hot. Um, very small. That's, that's zoomed in from quite a distance actually. This is their scratched out water hole. So if you're looking for water, uh, that's how you find it. Let them find it for you. This is Ayers Rock in the morning. And there's a view at sunset, which we toasted. This is a lady with her painting, which I purchased. Typical, uh, typical Aboriginal canvas. Alice Springs was known uh, as the only, it was the, the only place where uh, telegraphs and mail came and then uh, to Australia and then it was disseminated from there. Um, so we got a nice tour of the Post and Telegraph office, very essential in the 1800s uh, during the gold rush especially. We also checked out School of the Air established in 1951. 
on the left you can see how it used to be they'd mail the textbooks and wait for the test to come back and uh, now it's all remote computerized like our kids have had to do this past year um, about 120 kids in the outback uh, take advantage of the school of the air we wanted to check I wanted to check out the flying doctor service which services the outback people um, very essential from it from Alice Springs we went north to Cairn you can see how lush and beautiful uh, the topography is there we went to Port Douglas and boarded this uh, catamaran and headed out to the Great Barrier Reef also uh, on my bucket list was to snorkel the Great Barrier Reef uh, while I could fishies underwater came across this giant clam which we were told is uh, over a hundred years old three feet across just beautiful under there this is a, a short video of a parrotfish if you listen closely he's chomping on the coral I don't know if you can hear it hmm. Maybe you can't hear. Why would that be? Pam, if you mouse over the bottom of your screen again, where you have the play button. Yes. Um, it looks like this, there's a volume control at the far right at the bottom. Here? Um, to the right of that, that's mute. So unmute and then slide that up a little bit. See if that works. Oh, that does it. Hmm. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> all right from there we were heading to the Daintree rainforest which is a tropical rainforest arguably the oldest uh, one in the world and we were took a boat on the river there and these are um, zoomed in shots for sure the next two this is an amethystine python uh, non-venomous snake of course uh, they have so many uh, poisonous snakes and spiders and jellyfish and you name it in Australia there's more toxic animals there than most anywhere else in the world this is a little ki kingfisher in the rainforest itself uh, we see these ancient trees with buttress roots uh, the buttress roots help support them and also help uh, them obtain nutrients being above board there this is a Boyd's forest dragon luck chanced upon him these next two pictures are uh, even Native Australians rarely get to see a cassowary, a southern cassowary in the wild here. We're about uh, 10 yards from this guy uh, with lots of things between us, fortunately. Uh, they are the most dangerous bird in the world with their five inch middle claws. They can unzip you from stem to stern. Uh, they are the third biggest stratite next to the ostrich and the emu, but they are very, very uh, ominous birds actually to see.
There's one in captivity. <laughs> Again, much different to see one in the wild than uh, in this wildlife habitat. This is a tiny frog mouth. mouth. They uh, look like owls, but they're actually uh, in the nightjar family. And this one fellow just, we had a stare down contest. Uh, cute, I think. Rainbow lorikeets, nectar feeders, and uh, you see them very loud and belligerent uh, parrots in the urban areas. Dingo, dog, the main uh, predator of all these uh, kangaroos and wallabies and wombats. Uh, they don't know whether they should be classified as wolves or dogs, but I think they're going to end up calling them Canis Dingo. Laughing kookaburras, the largest member of the kingfisher family. This is obviously a male, uh, eastern gray kangaroo. They can be six feet seven inches up to 150 pounds uh, quite huge marsupials and one thing about them is you'll never see one hop backwards just the way they're built they uh, they cannot hop backwards i had the obligatory pose with tia the koala had to do it <laughs> This is a koala in the wild in the eucalyptus grove. You can see what a brush fire would do. Uh, they rarely get, climb down from their trees. So they really can got decimated in the bush fires, as we all, all heard. I zoomed on in on her. This is a mob or troop of eastern gray kangaroos. They are much like our uh, white-tailed deer, as I mentioned. They, uh, they're a food source. They're a pest. They also are very often motor vehicle crash causes. <laughs> Gala parrots are common in the parking lots and parks all around. Beautiful little birds. We're off to Sydney now. Flew from Cairns down to Sydney. Um, the day before, it was too smoggy, foggy from the brush fires to run the Sydney ferry. But the day we got there, they started it up again. So we were fortunate enough to have a nice tour of Sydney Harbor. Um, and we did also walk across the famous Sydney Bridge, Sydney Harbor Bridge. There's the bridge and the cruise ship, and on the right, the uh, Sydney Opera House. We got a good tour inside this Opera House. It's a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And in the evening, we came back and watched the light show on the, on the roof of it, which is uh, wonderful to see indigenous uh, film. Again, a botanical garden, a few pictures. Maybe uh, it's a giant uh, baobab tree, which I've never seen before. And a huge fig tree. Just nice to see color like that in December, um, as you all know, living here in the Northeast. Ibis among the plantings. Right in the middle of Sydney, there's a Chinese garden of friendship, which I enjoyed uh, amongst all the high rise uh, buildings. Right in the middle, there's a, a Zen place. Lots of skinks and lizards around there. 
which uh, my roommate was a bit terrified of. An Asian water blizzard. Just a nice peaceful place in the middle of a bustling city. Queen Victoria building takes up a whole block and it uh, within there's 200 some stores. Um, again, it's city, city stuff. St. Mary's Cathedral, where we heard carolers on the steps in the afternoon and had another light show on the face of in the evening of Madonna and child in art uh, pieces. All famous art pieces were reflected on the face of it. My idea of a pub. So uh, this is a good place to take any questions we might have uh, before we head off to New Zealand. Um, one of our participants has said that I've never traveled to Australia. How do you know you'll keep safe among all the venomous snakes and other beings? Did you research before you go or do you have a guide or what? Oh, we had a, um, a guide, a native guide from Melbourne uh, so he knew where to go. And then, of course, in the rainforest, and uh, we had a, also a guide, and we stayed on the trails, and they just uh, told us all about the where not to go, where to go. So definitely well taken care of and felt safe every bit of the trip. Thank you. Any more questions? No, no more. Okay. From there, uh, we'll go fly from Sydney to Wellington, 1,300 miles. Um, about New Zealand here, there's uh, things you should know. There's two main islands, the North Island, South Island. Actually, there's 600 islands all together about in New Zealand. Uh, Wellington is the capital. We flew in there and down the whole length of the South Island are the Southern Alps. So we went from there to Christchurch and across to uh, uh, on the Northwest coast to uh, Hokitika and back to Christchurch, then down to Queenstown, which they don't have listed here. And Milford Sound is on the Southern Southwestern coast and back to Christchurch to fly up in the North Island to Rotorua and then to Auckland and then back home. This is a cable car in Wellington, got to the top to get a view of the whole city. Uh, this is Parliament with its flag at a half mast. December 9th they had the White Island uh, volcanic eruption that killed 22 people. So that was a, a sad time while we were there, but um, we also got a nice tour of Parliament. Wellington Harbor. The Museum of New Zealand uh, was a wonderful thing to experience. Uh, the, Ma the Maori part was, you weren't allowed to take photographs of. Um, so I have nothing of that to show you, but this is a photograph, typical tattoos on the men. They have uh, tell significant um, events in their life and they have them tattooed on their bodies. The Maori are the original people, of course, of New Zealand. The natural history part of this museum, I enjoyed the colossal squid, especially. I never saw anything quite like that. Flying to Christchurch, uh, they had an earthquake in 2011 and they're still recovering. Christchurch Cathedral, uh, in need of help still, for sure. Monies for renovation. The downtown was uh, very much disrupted. 
And anything built back has to be to earthquake code. We didn't stay just one night in Christchurch and we were off across the country to the, through the Rubicon Valley. We visited a, a 2,000 acre sheep ranch that had 3,000 sheep and got those are Romney sheep on this particular ranch. A demonstration of shearing, demonstration of the sheepdog workings. Um, listen to this fellow's voice, a uh, little a different accent from uh, Australian. Again, it's can't hear him. Boss goes to my recommend. We've got a lovely piece of meat, a little bit of fat around the outside. You're happy, we're happy. 18 kilo, we get 135 dollars. So what happens from when the lambs are about three? <laughs> Listen to him all day and uh, we got in here full. Learned a lot. Uh, we had another stop at an organic dairy farmer, oh, which he doesn't really look like a dairy farmer, but he's holding up his map of his rotational pasture uh, where the cattle go to a different pasture every single day of the month. They come into this milking shed. They don't have barns. It's temperate all year long. Um, so the only manure they have to handle is what happens in the milking shed. Uh, they don't have to grow hay or grain, uh, make organic grass-fed milk. They powder it, a lot of it, send it to China. Uh, a lot goes as cheese and milk to Australia. And uh, they have time for keep a perfect uh, English garden in the back of their house after 40 years. He's passed it on to his sons. So yeah, that's the place to be uh, milk and cows, not in the Northeast uh, United States for sure, unfortunately. We made it to Hokitika, which is a little town on the Northwest coast, uh, founded during the gold rush and is now a, a more of an artist town. Um, there's the Southern Alps in the back. The river flows into the Tasman Sea behind us there. We had perfect weather the, really seriously the whole five weeks we were away. We stopped, uh, Hokitika has a lot of jade shops. Um, this Puna, Punama, Punamu I should say, uh, Maori for jade, um, well renowned in New Zealand. The Maori make car beautiful carvings from it different colors, different hardness. We took in the Hokitika Gorge with its suspension bridge and the Kiwi House, uh, New Zealanders nickname are Kiwis of course. Um, they're the smallest rat type with an egg that's 20% of their body size. They're nocturnal, so we couldn't take any pictures of them directly, but uh, they have little vibrissae on their beaks for feeling out their food and uh, very shy, shy chicken-like critters. Uh, their predator up here is a short-tailed weasel or stoat, which was imported to take care of the rabbits uh, population but now has endangered uh, the kiwis and other other birds. Um, not too smart, I guess, to import them. But also in the kiwi house, there were freshwater eels. These eels were about 100 years old, able to feed them. They're endemic to uh, only to the South Island of New Zealand. Another only uh, native to south, the South Island of New Zealand is a kia. This is an alpine parrot. Uh, very curious like all parrots and very raucous. We flew to Queenstown and took uh, the steepest gondola in the Southern Hemisphere to go to the top to get the view. Queenstown is kind of a self-proclaimed venture capital of the world. They were bungee jumping down below here. 
and parasailing from above. Again, a view of the Southern Alps. We had a wonderful uh, three hour adventure on the Hamilton jet boat designed and built in New Zealand for these shallow braided rivers, very shallow rivers. Uh, this is a little glacial cove, beautiful color water, of course. Southern Alps, so we're heading to Milford Sound. Whole field of lupin, like Susan's background. Next picture, beautiful glacier waters. Again, the uh, Southern Alps are in the way back. On the way to uh, let's see where we are here. On the way to Milford Sound, the Fiordland National Park with its mirror lakes, well aptly named. Glaciers up in the top. Glacial melt waters. Arriving at Milford Sound, we had a, a lovely tour, boat tour. Again, let me turn the volume up. I'd never seen any or been in any fjords before, so it was thrilling for me, for sure. The waterfalls, just the landscape. Flying back, there's a caldera, frozen caldera, back over the southern Alps. This is an example of a braided river, very shallow. Uh, we flew to Rotorua on the North Island, where the Maori uh, primarily live. This fellow uh, was a shaman, and this is their meeting house. Little, uh, whoops. He, uh, all these carvings are like their totems, uh, telling stories. Uh, it was a little, so guy took a little while to get used to his facial tattoos and his contemporary garb, but he uh, explained the history of his peoples to us and gave us all what's called a hangi, which is a breath of life, uh, forehead to forehead, nose to nose. This is a hangi. Uh, which is a buried feast, uh, buried with hot rocks. We took in a Maori cultural experience with the dancing and uh, the food and a demonstration of their wakas, the boats. Uh, we saw glowworms in the cave in the evening, saw them dance and uh, nice experience. Also by Rotorua, is a Waimangu Volcanic Valley, world's youngest geothermal area. Again, I'd, uh, well, this is an example of the 45 foot tree ferns that grew there. Steam vents, boiling water, you'd last less than a minute if you fell in. I have, I have yet to go to uh, Yellowstone or any place else where they had uh, steam vents and geysers. So this was also new to me. Strange topography, the strangest.
it was a big lake at the end of it uh, where the black swans were taking off and loaded with trout apparently in spite of uh, how hot things were down below. There were still steam vents all around the lake. Near the hotel we got to try out geothermal hot springs, naturally hot from, from the earth. Acidic ones were to help with uh, arthritis, alkaline ones with the skin, several ones we tried. Of course, no visit to New Zealand would be complete without a stop at Hobbiton, where the Hobbit trilogy was filmed. And the last stop in New Zealand was Auckland. It's a uh, sky tower and a view of the harbor. A view down from the sky tower. America's Cup Village is down below here where they have the great sailboat races. One more stop, seeing some beautiful roses. This is what New Zealanders do on Christmas Day, a picnic with their children in the parks and on the beaches. Quite a different uh, Christmas Day for those of us who know snow. So, the next day we left back to the States Another 16 hour trip back home. This is a, we gained our hour back, I guess, as I said. Um, this is a, a picture, a photo of a mural from the town of murals in Sheffield, um, Tasmania. And it epitomizes to me the spirit of adventure and discovery we feel when we head off to places yet unknown to us. Hopefully, we'll all be able to resume our travels very soon after this most unusual year. Thank you very much for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, a number of our participants have just commented on how beautiful and unique the animals and plants are, and they thank you a lot for sharing them. One person. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pam. Thanks, Charlie. That's all right. I, I'm trying to get my, uh, there we go, back. Yep. Yeah, the animals are what brought... turn your video back on. Okay. The animals are what uh, drew me initially, uh, one trip I wanted to make because of the animals. I'm not a city person by any means, but uh, we enjoyed the bigger cities as well while we were over there. And of course, eating lamb and tasting kangaroo and... Um, it was all just a marvelous adventure, really. What was the climate like while you were there? Like, what were the temperatures in New Zealand and Tasmania? Um, well, New Zealand was very, and ta Tasmania is very similar to New Zealand, very temperate. Uh, that dairy farmer was just in his shirt. It's like that all year long. Um, 50s to 70s, uh, primarily. Of course, up in the north in Cairn and Port Douglas, in the rainforest, it was hot and steamy. And uh, in the desert, of course, I don't know who can live it, who really would want to live there. But um, the Aborigines, they, they know how to be there. But we didn't have rain. We had uh, just wonderful weather the whole time. Unbelievable. Nice time of year to go. Another person asks, if they still have the immersed aquarium in Milford Sound. I never have heard of the immersed aquarium. I'm not familiar. Don't know okay. about that. More people are writing in to say that this was really terrific. 
Fabulous talk. Thank you so much. Beautiful presentation. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thanks. It's hard to sum up five weeks uh, in an hour. <laughs> There's Sue's uh, background uh, of a lake in New Zealand, the same one I took pictures of. Anyway. Yeah, that, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I will share a record of the chat and question answer with you because there are some people who are sending regards uh, from people that you probably know in the audience. So okay, thanks, Susan. I, I and and one that. just real quick question: Somebody would like to know if you were if you were to return, what area would you pick? Um, I would go back to New Zealand in a minute. Uh, if if it wasn't so far away. And that's why there's only 5 million people that live there because it is so far away, but it, it is an ideal climate. The, the people are wonderful. They are in Australia as well, but, uh, and it's all of course, English, uh, primarily people, um, very easy to be there uh, and to live there, but, uh, we wouldn't have our friends and families here, would we? Yeah. New Zealand is, very nice. No brush fires, just volcanoes <laughs> and earthquakes. <laughs> uh, well, very, very nice. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. We really enjoyed yeah. that. It's nice to travel when we can't. <laughs> yes, and hopefully we can again, all of us. I certainly hope so. Absolutely. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us this evening. And we hope to see you again soon.